Daniel Perry, 33-year-old white man, uh, has been convicted of murder in connection with his shooting of a man named Garrett Foster, 28, also white. Okay, so both guys are white. But Garrett Foster was a white man who was a BLM protester. And they encountered one another when Daniel Perry's car found itself in the middle of a BLM protest. And Foster came over to the window, the driver's side window. Some sort of a confrontation or words uh, were exchanged. And Daniel Perry, the 33-year-old, shot and killed Garrett Foster, the 28-year-old white man. He was in Austin, Texas. That's where the rally was happening. And he's just been found guilty by a jury. All right, well, might not get your attention. But now there's a big push immediately to have him pardoned. And Governor Greg Abbott has taken this on before there's even been a sentencing. Governor Greg Abbott has personally taken this on and said, um, do we have sound from him? I can't remember what we got, or it's just a tweet. No, okay, so he said, quote, in a tweet, I am working as swiftly as Texas law allows regarding the pardon, the pardon of Sergeant Perry. Texas has one of the st- strongest stand your ground laws of self-defense that cannot be nullified by a jury or a progressive district attorney. However, he can't just do it with his pen. He's got to get the Texas Board of Pardons and Parole to recommend the pardon before he can sign off on it. But after he took this stance, after I think Tucker did a segment on it and it got a lot of attention, all these texts of the accused murderer were released and they do not reflect well on Mr. Perry. So we'll get into all of it. Viva, I could see you wanted to say something in my description of the case. Go ahead. Yeah, I think maybe one critical element you missed is that the victim, the person who was shot dead, uh, was open carrying an AK-47. When oh, that's a big con- one. When he confronted Perry in the car. And as per Perry's testimony, it looked like he had the barrel raised, um, not aimed. That was a little discrepancy in the evidence at the trial, uh, but pointed in the, or lifted in the general direction of Daniel Perry, who... Uh, you know, then fired five shots. But yeah, the, the the open carry is the is the determinant element here as to who provoked who. Um, it's a, it's an interesting story. I, I followed a bit of the trial, and I've gotten into uh, debate on Twitter with another lawyer, um, Branca, who's a self defense lawyer, yeah, who seems to be, Branca. yeah, and he he's relatively convinced that this was uh, not self defense, um, right. and is challenging people's perceptions of that. It's. It's. I, I happen to disagree with the judgment, but it is. It is difficult to say. Well, I didn't hear the evidence. I wasn't the jury, but I am of the opinion that you know, if you take a wrong turn, or even if you turn deliberately, and your car is swarmed and encircled by uh, protesters, one of whom is carrying a weapon that uh, Perry said it wasn't. I didn't want to give him t- time to aim, but he said that it was pointed in a in a, in a potentially threatening manner. Um, I mean, everybody here is playing stupid games, and this is how tragedies happen. But there's a lot of inverted uh, comparisons that you can make to the Rittenhouse case where Rittenhouse crossed state lines with a weapon, was open carrying, and he was public enemy number one. And here, the same circumstance, the person who ends up getting shot and killed is public victim number one. So it's a mm. lot of ideal, you know, some double standards here. This guy who got shot and killed, um, Vinny, this uh, Garrett Foster, was there in like the Kevlar vest. He was dressed like he was going to war, this guy. So it's hard to believe that he was just out there for a little stroll, holding up a little placard, BLM. You know, he had the Kevlar, he had the AK-47. How do you even get your hands on that? Hello? That's the gun that all the people who want to take the guns away think everybody's running around with, but really they're not. This guy had it. And this guy who's, you know, they're both veterans in the in the car. You see that coming at you? I mean, I can understand his fear. However, the prosecution argued he was intentionally putting himself in the midst of this so-called protest, Vinny. Yeah, that, I think that's a, a, a key factor, right? Because you, in a self-defense case, what I've seen at court TV, and we've covered a lot of them, and, and we've covered a lot of not guilties, including the Kyle Rittenhouse case. Um, one distinguishing factor in the Kyle Rittenhouse case was video of everything that happened. And it was very compelling video. It was video, it was audio of, of everything that was happening that night, painted a, a much different picture than was painted by the media of what actually happened in the Rittenhouse case. This one now you're relying upon witness testimony and everyone and every witness in this whole thing obviously has some level of an agenda in the way they're going to see something right if you're at a protest you have you have a perspective you're there for a reason so um at the end of the day we you know we put it in the hands of a jury and the jury has to make a very tough call in self-defense the texas jury 
the Texas the jury. Texas jury, but you know, are we in Austin, Texas, or are we in the, the regular Texas? I'm yeah, this, that's this a good is, point. This is Austin, Texas. Okay, that's, that's, that's a good a, point. That's, it's that's not a, real that's Texas. A different state. <laughs> I've been there. It's, it's a different state than the rest of Texas. Uh, the it's laws true. are the same, but the people who are de- applying the law to the facts of the case are much, much different. So. Well, I but here, so he, the prosecution wanted us to believe that this guy, that Perry, sped up his car, like in an attempt to mow down protesters. And then this guy, Foster, was trying to stand up for the fellow protesters, like, hey, what are you doing? And uh, and he had a partner or a spouse who was, hold on, his fiance, who's a quadruple paraplegic black woman, the victim, Foster. Um that's his spouse. I don't know if she was right there with him, but the point they, the prosecution tried to say the the defendant Perry was, you know, a hothead who gunned the engine, tried to drive into this group of protesters. And then Foster was trying to say, Hey, what are you doing? But there was expert testimony there saying that the car did not speed up, that the there, one expert testified that he was slowing down when his car entered the demonstration. Um, so there was, you know, a dispute on that. The jury wound up I get. Well, I mean, they found against the defendant. So that matters because the Texas Stand Your Ground law, Viva, says as follows. Um, it removes the duty to retreat before using deadly force if the person is in a place they have a right to be. He was. That's He has that one. He is not engaged in criminal activity. That's also true. Even speeding up to get through a crowd of protesters. I don't, I don't know that you'd be charged with a crime. But here's the third one, and has not provoked his assailant. So the prosecution was trying to say, you did provoke. Um, you provoked this confrontation, and you can't, so therefore, stand your ground's not available to you. Yeah, and, and the, the basis of the provocation was allegedly turning his vehicle into the crowd uh, to provoke them. Uh, look, the, the problem is this. Yes, the, a jury found a verdict of guilty, and it's the risk of when you go to court and, you know, Fox News just avoided the risks of of leaving things in the hand of a jury. Uh, The broader problem might be you leave things in the hands of a jury of a crime that possibly ought not have been prosecuted in the first place. You can't then wash your hands of this unjust prosecution just because of a verdict. uh, Sorry, a jury subsequently ratified the prosecution, with which might be a questionable verdict. Yeah, they said okay, he provoked the crowd. but for Rittenhouse, I'd say, who would provoke a man carrying an AK-47? Who would provoke uh, a BLM rioters? By the evidence, the expert evidence, with which the jury heard and didn't take into or didn't um, retain, he wasn't speeding up, he was slowing down. By all accounts, his car got swarmed and encircled at a protest. And we have we live in a world where, despite the guy's text, which we, we do need to get to because they're yeah, very, very next. incriminating, we, we live in a world of, you know, the Rodney King uh, riots, where people were pulled out of their cars and beaten mercilessly, uh, where people are pulled from their cars and, and shot, where we saw what happened during the summer of love, uh, you know, people randomly shot by the by, by mobs who are on the street. So you have that it, it, always in the frame of the mind to explain the, the rationale of the person. One has to reconcile all of this now, however, with these prior texts, Facebook messages. DMs, all right, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in yeah, one second. But it. here's the thing. Here's what troubles me. So the, the um, Foster's family has a civil attorney who said, what is Governor Abbott doing? Talking about a pardon. We haven't even had the sentencing phase yet. And not, never mind an appeal. And he said, this turns the rule of law on its head. I totally agree with that. We cannot have governors stepping in before cases have even reached their finality to undo a jury verdict. And, because if you like, you may like it in this case, because you, you're you anti-BLM or you're pro-gun you know gun or what, whatever it is, um, you're not going to like it in the next one. Because that if that's the power of the governor, if that's appropriate action by a governor, you know how many cases they're going to undo that that you don't want to see undone? That's not the proper role for a pardon. And the jury had its say. The appellate process is there for a reason. So here's what happened. Abbott comes out, takes a strong stance, refers it to this parole board, went on April 10th. Um, Fox News is playing on it too. Like, yeah, this is an unjust verdict. Then they release uh, this guy, Perry, the defendant, uh, his texts. And one text, one ex- exchange did get in front of the jury, but it sounds to me, with, and I haven't gone in depth on this, but it sounds to me like the judge limited what would get in front of the jury to just this, so it wouldn't be too unfairly prejudicial to the defendant. Mm-hmm. What, was, what was shown to the jury was six weeks prior to the shooting, 
uh, Perry had privately discussed uh, a similar situation that happened between a driver and a protester in Seattle. And uh, he told a friend he had watched the video of it, of a protester getting shot in Seattle after pulling someone out of a car. And Perry said, uh, since that happened in Seattle, the gunman would probably go to prison. But if it were in Texas, he'd already be released. Okay, not great. Jury saw it. They did convict him. What wasn't shown to the jury, oh my God, was just all this crazy stuff. Perry often made racist comments. This is from the court filings. Um, they were released by the Travis County judge, unsealed by the Travis County judge. Often made racist comments, regularly made clear his desire to kill protesters in the months leading up to Foster's death, according to social media posts and texts contained. They say a newly unsealed court document. So I suppose, guys, it is possible the jury saw this and just we didn't see it. I don't know the answer. In a Facebook message from May 2020, just weeks before the shooting, Perry told a friend he might have to kill a few people who were riding outside of his apartment. Then said, uh, quote, I might go to Dallas to shoot looters. Said in a Facebook message two days later, no protesters go near me or my car. The other man replied, forgive me, audience, replied, can you catch me a Negro daddy? And Perry responded, that's what I'm hoping. Again, the man he shot was white, but he was at a BLM protest and his fiance was black and may or may not have been with him. Uh, he went on to say in another text message, the blacks are gathering up in a group. I think something's about to happen. I wonder if they will let me cut the ears off of people who've decided to commit suicide by me. Uh, went on to compare the Black Lives Matter movement to a zoo full of monkeys. I could go on. It's deeply disturbing. And this is, this is awful, but this is relevant. In April of 2020, he sent out a meme, which included a photo of a woman holding her child's head under the water in the bath with the text, quote, when your daughter's first crush is a little Negro boy. So in other words, a white girl being with a black boy or, you know, interracial uh, relationships tick this guy off. And that's what his victim was in. Again, do not know. It's relevant to find out whether the, the fiance was right by him. But the point is, here he is at a BLM riot. And all those statements, my God, my God, who would like to take it? I'll, I'll take I, I don't think that we, can, that we can equate a white person killing a white person with a, as, a, as, as a hate crime, as a, a race. I, I don't see the relevance of, of that stuff. You can talk about general character. But it's clearly irrelevant for the jury in, in, in this instance. The piece that was allowed in front of the jury, I think, is a great issue on appeal. Whether or I'm not just hearing that just my team is telling me the jury did not hear all that. I was right the first time. Right. All, all that stuff they didn't hear. But the one that they did hear, I don't even know if that was probative. Uh, it was more probative than, than prejudicial. I don't know what, what relevance it had. Going to bed at a decent hour did not always mean I got enough sleep. Often I was too hot, too cold, not that comfortable. That changed with my cozy earth bedding. The softest, most luxurious, it really is, and responsibly sourced bedding on the planet. Cozy earth bedding is naturally temperature regulating, so I sleep great in any weather. And I am not alone. Allison leaves this five-star review. Love them. Softest, most comfortable sheets I've ever slept on. Cozy earth bedding is made from 100% premium viscose from bamboo. Cozy Earth is so confident you are going to love their products. They offer a 100-night sleep trial, which means you have up to 100 nights to sleep on it, wash it, try it out. If you're not completely in love, just send it back for a full refund. Whether it's their luxury sheets, their loungewear, pajamas, or new bath towel collection, you will love shopping at Cozy Earth. And now you can order their bedding in five awesome colors. Uh, hurry, though. Save 35% right now on Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com, enter my promo code Megan, and save 35%. CozyEarth.com, promo code Megan, M-E-G-Y-N, CozyEarth.com. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.